All right, I'm really grateful to be here with you today, Ivea, to learn about some of the cool nature journaling that you're doing of California native plant restoration. I'm happy to be here with you, Marley. Great. So this seems like an area where um, you have expertise and a lot of people aren't necessarily combining these two areas. So um, one of the things that I'm hoping for in this conversation is to kind of um, help the people that are doing nature journaling and then help the people who are doing native plant restoration and see how those two kind of types of people can either overlap or, or learn from each other. Absolutely. So. I guess like one of the first things is, um, do you have any pages that you could share of any of the restoration work that you're doing in the San Francisco Bay area? Absolutely. Um, so at the beginning of my notebook, I create, um, I create a map so that that way I can always have an idea of what my site looks like. And then I created another one where I could outline the areas where I work specifically. Um, and I gave them each little names too, so that I always know where I am. Nice. Um, so then it can be anything from writing down a map that's about a specific place that you work with in that. I labeled all of the shrubs here so that that way I'd be able to know, you know, certain areas that would need more attention, which yeah. areas I should free from, from intrusive plants. Um, sometimes I will do a, a little profile of a plant, um, or uh, a cartoon <laughs> like this one. Um, and I've noticed that sometimes when you do um, something in a story form, it makes it more fun to follow along later. Yeah. Um, let's see here, here's an inventory I took uh, of certain plants that were crowding out a species that I'm trying to protect. Uh -huh. uh, let's see. How are you doing those prints? What is the, what are you laying the leaf down and then sort of painting watercolor around it? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. Initially, I'd been trying to do this thing where you paint the leaf itself and then you lay it down on the paper and you pick it off. And uh -huh. some days the thing works and some days it doesn't so much. So this okay, is sort of, it. yeah, and it didn't work that day. So instead what I did was I put the leaf down and then painted around it so that, that way the negative shape, especially up in here, would really show the shape of the leaf. Um, let's see here, there's another page when I was pulling up French broom. Um, let's see. Sometimes I take inventories of who's flowering. Ooh, so that way I can- Wow, control. that's a lot of flowers. Yes. Th this one was fun, but this particular type of page takes a while. So mm -hmm. I took, um, so instead I took that idea and I made a list oh. for myself. So then that way it'd be easy to just check off. Oh, wow. Real and- cool. Thank you. And then you just can add on names. Yeah. As, yeah. It's fun that way. Wow. Um, I'm trying to think if I've got any other really good pages in here. Um, oh, or I remember seeing that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This yeah. one, I was trying to illustrate where the, um, like, this is a Ceanothus right here. And it was so covered in Cape Ivy that I couldn't even see it at first. And the Cape Ivy, meanwhile, I'd only come over here because the Cape Ivy was growing up this one brush pile. And so um, by discovering this one, I wanted to note that I'd, I hadn't even been able to see it. This day, I couldn't do a full on landscape ito, So I just huh. drew a little bit about the target plant we were pulling out that day, which is this one called um, birch herbal. Oh. And then, yeah. Um, and I always keep notes of what I do and, um, you know, like what our goal was of the day, what the result was if I can, um, and then maybe some other notes and observations. Great. Maybe you could describe sort of um, a recent nature, a recent experience when you were doing um, native plant restoration in, in one of your areas and uh, sort of like how how it was like sort of a narrative there of like how it was and how you combine nature journaling or just kind of like tell us a little story about one of these um, recent recent trips. Absolutely. Um, OK, so one of the things that I did recently um, was we recently got to go back into weeding out um, uh, Cape Ivy. And, and that one is one that we couldn't weed out for quite a while because of bird nesting season. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was ecstatic to finally get to weed that one out again because it has a tendency to take over. And yeah. so um, when I was weeding it out of this one Ceanothus bush, 
I noticed some certain things in the bush. Like I noticed the skin of a lizard. I noticed the body of um, either a mouse or something else, but where its skull was actually visible. So that was really cool. And I noticed a nest. And so um, because we're not allowed to remove things from the national parks, I can't exactly take those specimens home to study them further. Right. So in, what I might do is I might do a quick sketch in my journal or take a picture to do it later. And what I wanted to do that I'm still working on in my journal is I wanted to make a map of where I found each of those specimens mm -hmm. um, in that one Cenothus bush. Cool. And so how does this sort of like fit into your work there? Like are the other people, you know, still have their gloves on and they're like, you know, machetes or shovels, like hacking away at stuff. And you're like, pause, I'm going to like nature journal for a little bit. Like, how does, how do you fit? How does that part work? Well, I try really hard not to do, not to do my nature journaling while we're actively working, but luckily we do take breaks, usually like 15 minute breaks, um, every few hours. Mm -hmm. And so what I'll do is during then I'll try to jot down a quick little note or at most, while we're working, sometimes I might stop to take a quick picture. Um, but what I do is I try to frame, like, for example, the other day I wanted to get a good a good visual in my head of how um, the cape the cape ivy leaves down runners and how you could have this long um, strand that looks like it's nondescript dead and brown, but that suddenly the green will pop up in different areas. Oh. And so I had to put the cape ivy in a specific place so that I could see all of those details and then take the picture. So even that has kind of an art to it if I don't have time to do a quick sketch. Mm -hmm. um, but then like on that same day, I also happened to see a, um, a woodpecker. So I did like a quick little sketch before it could go away. Um, and that was all I managed to get at that one moment. Um, but then just by starting the entry in the field, it helps me remember more later on um, what I have to do or else like I could start, um, sorry, mirroring. Um, like here, I started out with just a sketch of what this looked like. And then later on when I got home, I added in the colors because I wanted to really remember how it was spreading. Cool. Um, and that Great. helped, yeah. Um, nice. Yeah, I have some more questions about like technique and stuff for in the field, but maybe it would be a good right now to sort of talk about like, what is native plant restoration or ecological restoration or habitat restoration? Um, like, what is it like? How would how can we define that? I know that there's different definitions, but maybe just kind of hearing like yours just so that people understand what we're talking about here. And then maybe, you know, defining to trying to define it. Um, and then also like why, why, like what is the, what is the idea or sort of the, the goal behind it? I love that question. Um, so the way I would define um, plant restoration or habitat or ecological restoration is taking a natural um, ecosystem that has been destroyed or degraded and working to repair or renew it and make it healthier. And the reasoning for that is because it, um, there's a lot of really rare plants and animals in the world, and and a lot of them will have will be limited by their habitats or by their homes, by the by the area that they're allowed to live in. And so, for example, if you live in a place like a city, where urban development will take away a lot of the natural areas, then you have plants and animals that don't have a lot of places to live. And so, by fixing those areas, we give them more, you know, not only more places to live, but also we preserve biodiversity. Um, or, you know, a lot of different types of organisms living together. And that's really important for increasing ecosystem health and the health of us too, indirectly. Um, so it. that's the idea. So how about, maybe you could talk a little bit about the specific area where you work. I know that it's kind of a hot spot for native plant restoration. And I've like listened to some podcasts and stuff recently that talk specifically about that area. So maybe for people who aren't familiar um, and maybe for people who actually live there but don't know, could you describe some of the special stuff and, and where exactly you work? Absolutely. Um, so I live in San Francisco, um, big urban area, and I work in a particular part called the Presidio. So if San Francisco Peninsula is a thumb, then the Presidio is, I guess, on, on this one point of it, to the west. Um, to the Northwest in, in San Francisco. So it's this massive park, but not like the type where you'd have ornamentals like Golden Gate Park. It's part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. So it's, it's which is in turn part of the national parks. 
So we have a lot of plants and animals and types of environments there that you don't get other places like um, serpentine grasslands, serpentine bluffs, um, just very unique area. And part of why that is, is because of course, San Francisco has been really developed um, into a city. In fact, we unfortunately have the distinction of being the last known place of the Xerxes butterfly, this, um, which is this gorgeous little blue butterfly um, that flew until about the 1940s and then disappeared. Um, the last place it was seen would have been in the dunes here in San Francisco. And it's known as being the first um, insect in North America that we can identify going extinct because of our wow. activities, human activities. Wow. So that's kind of a grave distinction here for San Francisco. So we have a lot to renew here in San Francisco. What about like endangered, aren't, aren't there some of the most endangered, I mean, I, this podcast I listened to said the two most endangered plants in the world are in San Francisco and there's some extinct ones as well. Could, could you talk a little bit about any of those? Oh yeah, the manzanitas. So there's two of them um, and they're both known as being the living dead because in each of these manzanitas, there's the raven's manzanita, um, and then there's the Franciscan manzanita. And with each of these, there's only one distinct member of, of the entire species left, just one. And I'm not sure about the Franciscan, but I know for a fact that the Raven's manzanita is what we call dioecious, which mm -hmm. means that you have, you have flowers that produce seeds on one plant and flowers that produce pollen on a different one and not on the same plant, mm -hmm. which means that it's pretty much like having a male and a female plant. Mm -hmm. um, and the one we have left is a male plant, which means that unless it finds another plant to reproduce with, it's doomed. And we only have the one left that we know about. And then that we discovered that, I want to say like in the 80s or 90s, but I can't remember when. Mm -hmm. um, and then just within the last 10 years, we found the Franciscan manzanita. And so it's happened twice in wow. here. Um, and the thing is that we only know of these two, but we're hopeful. You never know. Someday, maybe we'll find another one of either of them. Or maybe, you know, the seed bank will get disrupted and another one will spring up. You never know. So we, we have to be hopeful. And because we're doing the restoration work, it's more likely that one of them will be able to come back mm -hmm. because we're doing this work. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that and maybe like the difference of like, you know, focusing on single species, like single species management versus sort of like, you know, kind of managing for a lot of species or for an ecosystem. Absolutely. Um, and I think it, it, a lot of it will come down to what is, what's that word again? What's that word that charismatic? That's right. Yeah. Charismatic. Species. <laughs> um, so, so when you look at the single species, that's more of an idea to give um, people a face of, you know, who needs our help. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that a lot of times they're going to be about an entire ecosystem. So it's not just these manzanitas. Sorry. Yeah. Anything. It's uh, not just panda bears or, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever caribou or something like that. Bald eagles. Exactly. Falcons. Yeah, it's the home that they live in. And so with the manzanitas, it's not enough to just save a few of the manzanitas. You have to actually save the entire environment around it, um, it the entire ecosystem. And But because a lot of times people will only be swayed about, oh, this one thing, this one plant, this one animal, then sometimes the funding has to go specifically for like a manzanita. Mm -hmm. um, but we can through our work also work to improve the environment around it. Um, so, for example, the place where the Franciscan manzanita was found was on this little teardrop-shaped island in the middle of Doyle Drive, which is a really busy road that leads into being a highway um, mm -hmm. right near the Golden Gate Bridge. And it was this one little survivor that happened to be stuck there on this little island in the middle of all these cars. And because the Doyle Drive was going to be um, sort of reconstructed for earthquake proofing, then they happened to find this plant and they were lucky to be able to get funding from a lot of different places to move the plant to safety. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the funding would go to the place where it originally lived. Like mm -hmm. you're not going to get a ton of people wanting to put funding on the coastal bluffs or, mm -hmm. you know, on serpentine grasslands. Um, mm -hmm. But while you're, hopefully you can take some of that, you can, the place that you move it to, or when you have clones of them, then hopefully that good luck or that attention can rub off on the environment around it. And that's what Got we do. Okay, so I guess the, the another question I would have is um, sort of a devil's advocate question is like, is there any reason, and I think you alluded to this earlier, but like 
besides just like like saving this plant just for the sake of saving this plant like why mm -hmm. should we like care like is it is it like okay to just let some of these plants go extinct or animals go extinct or like why should, or these habitats to disappear like if it's just you know like from a purely like self-centered human-centered perspective like are there reasons why we should care besides just like to preserve biodiversity yeah and i think that it's because of health um so for example it might seem like an awful lot of effort to go through for a plant that might never recover that we know for a fact could die but again because we're looking at the environment itself there will be associated species with it and it's important to be able to have a lot of diversity in the habitat because for example suppose that we live in a woods where there's only one kind of an oak tree and you know you think oh the oak tree is strong you know we don't need a ton of oak trees suppose that there's a year that comes along where that oak for whatever reason maybe it gets a disease maybe the conditions aren't right maybe it the point is that it doesn't produce enough acorns and there are a lot of different species that depend on these acorns take maybe woodpeckers it's important to be able to have maybe some other kind of oak tree in that forest or some other food source for that for the for the woodpeckers to be able to have if that one doesn't work out and it's mm -hmm. the same way with having as many different kinds of plants and, and and animals and diversity as possible is that then it sort of is a fallback for if one species isn't doing so well one year another one might be doing better and it's sort of like having a lot of different legs to support a table instead of having just two and you know you have two-legged table and then it just falls over. Yeah. Um, so you want to have as many different supports as possible and that comes in the form of diversity. Got it, okay. Um, and so it sounds like there's probably, maybe you could describe some of the work that people have to do to in, you know, for um, native plant restoration or for some of these other types of habitat restoration. Like what are some of the main, um, main things that people are doing? Totally. Um, so first of all, I happen to work with the National Park Service. So that means that there's a whole lot of bureaucracy involved in that, but it doesn't necessarily even take, <laughs> it doesn't take necessarily an official organization to do that. Yeah. Um, there's, for example, there's um, a project here in San Francisco. Um, and I can't remember the name of it, but it has to do with the green hair streak butterfly and making a corridor for them to connect. And all that is are people who live in the Sunset District planting plants that they know that the green hair streak likes oh. so that, that way the different populations can find each other so you don't need bureaucracy to be able to do it you just need research and collaboration to be able to do it um, so the kind of work that i do is that i go to designated places where we have projects to do and I, a lot of my work is weeding mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of it is just pulling out plants that kind of offset the balance um, because certain ones will create monocultures. Like I'm sure a lot of people have gone by the highway and seen ice plant and mm -hmm. that you can see that there's not a lot of other plants growing aside from the ice plant. And so we try to make it so that a bunch of different species can thrive. Um, there was also this one project we had um, back in the late nineties, early two thousands, which was the restoration of Chrissy Field Marsh. And with that one, it was a lot of planting we would weed them after we planted them. And before even that, um, they had construction crews come out with their heavy, heavy machinery to excavate out the marsh um, because the marsh had been used as a trash dump and filled in with old ammunition, pottery, ruins of buildings, um, cow bodies of all the random things. And so they had to excavate out the marsh and, and take out all of that trash first. So it was kind of multi-level. First you had like, the funders who who are going to be donors to to make this project happen then you had the planners then you have the heavy machinery and then our work as the volunteers and all throughout that a lot of monitoring to make sure that it was going well and to get data but the result is wow. that now we have thousands of birds tons of plants um, a very healthy new ecosystem and also people like being there mm -hmm. um, people you know, it's nature right there in the city. So you don't have to go way out into the middle of nowhere to see excitement. You can just be there and you can watch, you know, seagulls dropping mussels down on the on the bridge and seeing, you know, the mussels crack open so that the seagulls can eat them and be like, wow, those birds are smart. Or, you know, maybe you'll see other birds fighting over something <laughs> or I don't know, just, or you see the way that the marsh's shape changes based off of whether you have high tide or low tide. So it's one of those things that benefits everybody. 
And I think I got off track. What was your question again? No, that's really great because I think you're pointing out that there's also these um, mental health benefits of the habitat restoration. And I know that one of the speakers at Wild Wonder was all her whole talk was, and she's a doctor, her whole talk was about like the mental health aspect of, of like being able to access nature, spend time in nature is actually like a mental health requirement. And she at one point was kind of questioning the term nature and suggesting that maybe the term biodiversity would be better because it seems like from her experience that one of the things that has the mental health benefit is being in a place where there is biodiversity as opposed to just being in a place that's like a whole bunch of like London plane trees or just like a big, huge grass lawn um, with a view of the sky. I mean, that's nice, but she was pointing out the biodiversity. So thanks for pointing that out. And then it also sounds like what you're saying is that the work that, and that was my original question is like, what kind of work um, constitutes habitat restoration and native plant restoration. So it sounds like there is a whole lot from like uh, fundraising, um, monitoring, um, a lot of like clean, clean up, um, and a lot of weeding and planting. So, um, thanks for sharing that. That's a whole lot of things. So based on like all of those different, um, jobs, like where can nature journaling fit in or like for people who aren't, um, didn't already drink the nature journaling Kool-Aid, like, and are doing all of these other jobs, like how could you convince them or like, where can they make space for nature journaling among all those other things? Hmm. First of all, choose this if you're passionate about it. I think that it can be, if you are sort of person who finds a lot of benefit to going out and doing field work or to changing the world, then the way that nature journaling can fit in is that it keeps track of how you changed the world. And it's important to note our own impact on the environment. If, I mean, if we're out there looking at nature and saying, you know, we saw this bird doing this thing and that thing, I wonder, or, you know, this plant's growing here, I wonder what it's gonna be like next year. If we ourselves are adding to that by doing habitat restoration, we have to keep track um, so that we know how we, you know, how that changed next year because of us. Um, also because it helps to validate the work we do when you see it written down, you realize, hey, you know, that really happened. Um, I really did that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it also gives you a lot more questions. I think that nature journaling really helps because it makes you think differently when you're in the field so that you could you could be, you know, kind of in the rhythm of just pulling up a plant or maybe you're watering things. Maybe, you know, you're carrying the heavy buckets and you're watering plants that need it. And mm -hmm. you can just get into that rhythm and and, you know, not really be thinking very much. But you can also be using that to actively think about, you know, could I do this in an easier way? Um, is there an order of operations that I can do this that would make it more successful than if I did this a different way? So by nature journaling it, it makes you a better steward. It makes mm -hmm. you more efficient at what you're doing. And also you might notice things that other people haven't noticed before. Um, maybe you are suddenly in the habit of looking around and saying, hey, that's a plant I didn't see here before. And then you write down where you saw it because you're already in the habit. Of, of keeping your notes. Um, so that's why, those are some reasons why you, you want to combine the two. Okay, those are really good reasons why. Now, how about how? So like what tips and tricks do you have? Because like, for example, I've been working on um, a plant restoration project um, in the San Pablo Bay uh, Wildlife Refuge. And every time that I've gone there, I, I do look around and think like, oh, this would be really cool the nature journal here and I've taken like photos and you know used iNaturalist a little bit which I should put the link up for that because you mentioned you use that as well and I've like used iNaturalist um with my photos but I haven't it's always felt like there's like a time crunch um and I am getting paid by like a bureaucracy and so like and working with other people so how do you like and also, you know, there's a lot of like dirt and mud and like sometimes you're wearing gloves. Like what are, from your experience, you know, like what are some ways that can make it easier? So my tips would be these. So for one, and I say this, I think I say this once in an interview, go easy on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that winds up being super important because the reality is that when you're out there doing the field work, nature journaling isn't the priority, it's the field work. Um, and the nature journaling is kind of a supplemental, but a very important one. Um, another one is 
don't try to be perfect on your pages. You don't, you do not have the time for it. Um, go for speed as opposed to detail. Um, so, you know, scribbles, quick, quick scribbles if you can. Also, um, memory journaling is a good thing to practice because you're not going to be able to write everything down in the field. So write down the really important things in the field. Also, it can help you to have a, a really simplified format. So maybe it's that you're writing down, you know, oh, today's date is this. The objective was this. We got done this. And maybe mm -hmm. that's the bare minimum of what you write down. And then everything else is notes after that. Find ways of making it fast on yourself and also be okay with writing small entries. If you have a really big entry, I mean a really big journal, sorry, then you're going to be feeling a lot more pressured to make a longer entry and you're going to feel bad about yourself or at least you're more likely to unless you train against that. You're going to feel you might be more likely to feel bad if you don't fill an entire page. Mm. So if you have a smaller journal, then you don't have to work as hard to fill the entire page and you get a better sense of accomplishment dopamine slosh, et cetera, you want to do it again. Yeah. Um, so be okay with, with, you know, not having a huge entry. Be okay with the fact that you're not going to write everything down and the field's going to be there waiting for you and it will jog your memory later. And um, and so that those, those things will help you. Also, if you have certain ideas of how to capture information, try just using one of those techniques a session. Mm. So maybe this, you know, maybe this week's session is that you are going to do a map of a certain area, a really fast map. Um, and then you're not going to worry about, you know, doing a species inventory or doing a, a landscape pitho. Maybe it's just going to be a quick map. Also, if there's any way you can do the work in advance, like if you happen to have Google Maps and you can do a quick sketch from Google Maps first, then it means when you get into the field, you don't already have to do all of that background work and you can just add the details that you observed that day in the field. Um, so as much work as you can do beforehand really will help you too. And wow, those are, those are really good tips. It seems like you've kind of worked on like thought about this a lot. <laughs> yes, I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, what do you think about the idea of like um, specialization maybe? Because it seems like a lot of times when you're doing restoration work, you're working with a team of people. What do you think about like, does it make sense maybe sometimes to have like a person who is, you know, more focused on that? Or are there already sort of, um, roles in restoration teams and maybe there's like a certain role that would make more sense for nature journaling as opposed to others or like is there a way that that you know a team of people could be um, you know broken up in a way where one person is like maybe just nature journaling the whole time or something like that I personally think that would be awesome and really fun that's something I've been wishing we could do um, because I'm the only nature journaler out there, that's not really, unfortunately, that's not really much of a thing that we do um, right. where I am, but I can totally picture it. Um, this is not habitat restoration, but this is garden work. I've been working in this garden, um, also ironically enough out in the Presidio at this place called the Chrissy Field Center. And I was trying to get staff to be more involved. And so a thing that was both fun and also very helpful was that I gave the staff the option of signing up for a plant buddy. And their only assignment was to once a month write down at least one observation about their plant. And then that way we have, you know, 20 or so people writing observations about 20 different plants. Suddenly that means that one person doesn't have to write down about all 20 plants and mm. it gets more work done. It's more even distribution of work. And then that way everybody has got their own perspectives and people will notice different things. So I think that'd be fabulous to do that, like with a restoration crew. Maybe you maybe you do have one person nature journaling the whole time, or maybe you switch out and a person will take a 10 minute break to nature journal something and then maybe somebody else does. Right. Yeah. Or maybe it could cool. be the or it could be that you have like specific things that you journal about. So maybe one person is assigned to take down quick bird notes about the day. Then the next person takes the journal and makes down notes about the plants. And maybe somebody else writes down, oh, we did this work and that work and this work and that work. And maybe they're about the numbers. And even more fun, I think, would be if you had a group nature journal so that all of the observations could go into the same journal. Because mm -hmm. then you have the whole story told by different people, kind of like a tapestry of information woven together. I don't know, I think that'd be really fun, but I've never gotten to try that before with, with a restoration crew. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. What about like, I wonder if there's a way that, you know, if this became more well known, then maybe, um, you know, restoration crews could, or the organizations that are doing that work 
could invite, there could be maybe like a list of nature journalers who are interested in that kind of nature journaling and they could invite someone to come and nature journal and maybe they could participate, they could pull weeds also if they want to, but they could come in nature journal like at that site. I like that idea. And I mean, that, that would make sense because sometimes you have to sometimes keep work journals anyway where you note things down. So right. adding a nature journaler wouldn't be that much of a stretch. Mm -hmm. um, you have people who already keep, who already might keep, you know, a work diary. And plus, mm -hmm. sometimes you might have like a scribe of the group. Well, it would make sense if the mm -hmm. scribe were a nature journaler. So I think that'd be yeah. fabulous. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, um, that sort of, I feel like we've talked a little bit about, you know, what, um, uh, you know, kind of like how these two things could combine, but maybe like more specifically, like what are, you know, if we're thinking about these as sort of two different fields and there is some overlap, like in, in, in yourself, for example, but like, what are some things that nature journalers should know about native plant restoration and other types of habitat restoration? Like, for people for for people who are nature journaling already but no don't really know anything about this sort of other field what would you what are some things that they should know okay so i would say um start where you live first of all if you live in a place where you're worried about the health of your environment or or i would say I think it's a good idea for people to know what the closest endangered plant or animal is to them or the closest endangered ecosystem or degraded ecosystem. Um, because when you know, like, it's easy to care about something that's happening really, really far away because there's a certain way of framing it as being really charismatic and then you donate. But I think it's a lot more impactful when you know what's going on in your own backyard. So if you can start there, um, then the hard thing I think is finding organizations. So I was lucky I got to do this work through the National Park Service, but other times there's like Fish and Game, um, maybe Audubon Society would know things. You could, the, the important thing is to be able to know if there are already organizations doing this and also to be able to do enough research so that you know exactly what you're saving um, mm -hmm. and, and to know the full issue of what's happening. And I'm not sure I'm answering your question, though. No, I mean, I feel like that is a huge piece. So, like, maybe nature journalers just need to, um, like, try to focus on stuff that's close to home, learn yeah. about, like, what agencies or organizations are working on those things, and then get involved there first. And that's how they can make the biggest impact. Yes, definitely. Okay, that's great. So then what about for people who are doing... Um, restoration work already, but don't really know about nature journaling, like what do they need to know about nature journaling or like how would you pitch nature journaling or kind of describe nature journaling to them like the essentials? I would say that nature journaling is a way of engaging even more. So if you're doing the restoration work and you have those questions in the back of your head while you're doing the work, it's a way of remembering them and writing them down. Um, it's also a way of being more being more observant about the field. And even like one of the more important things is that it's also a great way of communicating that to other people mm -hmm. is that nature journaling is a way that you can advocate for your restoration work by showing other people what's in your head and why you ought to care about it. Um, because it's a way of trying to capture the wonder of the world around you. And if you're trying to get more people to be passionate, I can think of no better way. How about some... Uh like challenges, like what are some of the main challenges like in trying for you that you've experienced in that uh, you can kind of maybe share like or kind of inoculate people to before that they go out there and then they're like, oh gosh, this is like hard. Um, but like, yeah, if you could share some of those that maybe hearing about them from you would help people um, when they hit them in the future. Well, I know I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. Challenge number one, nature journal and tool. Uh -huh. Do both at once. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, one of them is making the time and figuring out the right time balance. Uh -huh. Another one of them is going easy on yourself when you can't draw a perfect drawing. Um, uh -huh. Like here, here's an example. Um, back when I was more getting started on doing my restoration work, I had really pressured myself to make it look perfect. Um, yeah. So I did a page, this one, for example. Uh -huh. And you see this kind of work because you'd think as a nature journaler, you know, these are the pretty pages that we like to picture, except uh -huh. that 
do you think I actually did this in the field? <laughs> no. And do you think that this took me like five, 15 minutes? No, this took me a month. It took uh -huh. me a month to do that page. So you gotta be okay with doing pages that maybe don't look that great. Uh -huh. You know, this one has no color. It has, you know, it, it's not like it's got a really pretty format or whatever, but it doesn't matter because it's informative. Yeah. So be okay with doing that. Sometimes one of the hard things is being able to stand up and do nature journaling when you're maybe in really rough terrain. Cause mm -hmm. if you're surrounded by plants that you can't sit on, then you're not gonna be able to sit down and do this. You know, you're trying to reach for your supplies. So always, you know, pack light, uh -huh. pack as lightly as you can, try to carry as little as you can. Um, and, you know, be okay with juggling a little bit, be okay with looking a bit ridiculous. And also sometimes I know I get embarrassed sometimes when I'm, you know, nature journaling and my, my supervisors are very kind to me. They've never made fun. And my uh -huh. fellow, and my fellow restorationists, you know, that my fellow volunteers, they've all said, Oh, wow, cool. And then, you know, they look over my shoulder and then they say, good job and stuff. But you have to feel a little bit embarrassed that you're sitting here drawing and doing art while, you know, you're trying to save the planet. Uh -huh. So kind of deal with that. And then, you know, just have a sense of humor about it. Say like, so what do you think is the single one hardest part? Trying to do the entry while you're standing up, the physical <laughs> logistics, it's ridiculous. Uh -huh. <laughs> Especially okay. if you're carrying tools with you. Yeah. yeah. All right, but, cool. Like this one. How are you gonna nature journal while you're carrying this in your hand? Oh, yeah. Does it have nice to oak all over it? Sorry? Does that have poison oak oils all over it? This one, no, luckily. Uh -huh. But I did get oaked recently. I I was being ridiculous and I got poison oaked. So oh shoot, that's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, and wash your gloves. <laughs> wash your gloves. Okay, cool. What about any sort of last kind of motivational things that you would share with people who are considered who are sort of on the fence? of of like diving into this and they're kind of but when they actually get out they've thought about it before and then they get out there and then they just pull weeds and and then you know drink their uh you know coconut water or whatever on their break and eat their snack and don't actually nature journal like any last sort of words of encouragement absolutely um a big one and i, I only just thought of this right now is that it feels like you're taking the field with you if you nature journal it, because mm -hmm. then you can take the notes in the field, but usually you'll find yourself at home writing down something else or, you know, maybe sketching from a photo. And then you suddenly remember something else that happened in the field that was exciting to you and you want to write it down. Nature journaling, it keeps the adventure alive and keeps the motivation strong for going out there and doing it again and again. And the more you do it, the more special the field feels to you, the more, the more you value what you do. So I highly, I highly recommend everybody try it. Wow, that is really cool. Thanks um, so much for all those like really well thought out tips and everything. Um, and where can people see like more of the work that you're doing? So um, you're always welcome to check out my Instagram. Um, I'm Ivea. Right here, people can type it in. Thank you. Um, and and I often will post my journal entries of uh, my my diary entries from my my journal here on there. Um, and then also. I recently gave a presentation for my friend Brian Higginbotham's class, and I'm gonna be re-recording it soon so you can check my YouTube channel um, to see that soon. I will be Great. having a presentation. And you have a bunch of other uh, plant-related and other nature journaling videos on there also. So I'll put that, I'll put um, a link to Ivea's YouTube channel in the description below. Um, cool, I think maybe the next step is at some point we should do a video of um, nature journaling, uh, native plant restoration in the field. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> I'm totally right. cool. Well, thank you so much for making the time today, Eva. It's been really fun talking to you. It's been really wonderful talking to you too, Marley. So thank you and join me. <laughs> Yay. All right, bye everybody. Bye.